Intramuros is very important to us because of the lessons in heritage and history. Siguro in one line no, ng objective ng Bahay Chinoy, establish our rightful place in the Philippine sun. Nag, uh, bukas ito sa public noong 1999, no? uh, inilalarawan nito ang bahagi at ang impact ng mga Chinese Filipinos in all aspects of Philippine life. I wish that the Bahay Chinoy can be recognized in the whole Intramuros and the whole Philippine society. I wish all the visitors, the audience, regardless of race, regardless of origin, regardless of your religion, can be recognized as part of this nation and as part of this uh, nation building and the history of the Philippines. Ako po si Teresita Angsi, founding president ng Kaisa Para sa Kaunlaran, at ngayon ay executive trustee ng Kaisa Heritage Foundation na nagmamanage sa Bahay Chinoy Museum of the Chinese in Philippine Life. Established in 1999 by the Kaisa Para sa Kaunaran Incorporated, the Kaisa Heritage Center, or better known as Bahay Chinoy, was a project advocating the historical and cultural legacy of Chinese Filipinos in the Philippines. In the museum, you would see how the Chinese influence the Filipinos in different aspects of the Philippine life, as far as culture, food, languages, okay? and we were part of each important event in the Philippine history. So we started with how the Chinese came to the Philippines as traders first, and later migrated to the Philippines because they were experiencing famine too in China, and later immersed with the people, and a lot of them decided to bring in their family. Promoting and hastening the integration of the Chinois in the community and bridging the understanding of the mainstream Philippine society to the Chinese community are also among the main objectives of Bahay Chinoy. The importance of this museum is we want to tell the Filipinos that the Chinois are actually Filipinos foremost but with Chinese descent. We are part of the whole community and in this museum you could see that in every aspect of Philippine life the Chinese participated. Besides the wax figures depicting the Chinoy history the museum also houses a gallery of rare prints and photographs depicting the old Chinese occupations, as well as a library and research and data bank that contains a collection of current research materials. Bai Chino is one of the very rare museums in Southeast Asia that features the local Chinese Filipinos. So a lot of the countries in Southeast Asia would have Chinese museum, but Bai Chinoy is not a Chinese museum. It's a Filipino museum. So what you see here is Philippine history, but of course we highlight the aspect where the Chinese gave a very important influence. Now let's explore more on what to see inside Bahay Chinoy. Our tour here in Bahay Chinoy is very informative. Mm. I didn't actually expect to learn a lot. And it's very exciting to know that there are many Filipino-Chinese personalities before na who played a big role in our Filipino-Chinese history. It's such a great experience. The culture, tradition, and heritage of the Chinese Filipinos are clearly depicted in this place. But above all, it represents the stronger bond between two nations. Visit them at 32 Anda Street, 
Corner, Cabildo Street, Intramuros, 1002 Manila, Philippines. For inquiries, you may email via info at bahaychinoy.org. Hello everyone, sorry for keeping you waiting. We'll start our program in a few minutes. For you to be updated on the activities of Kaisa Para sa Kaunlaran and Bahay Chinoy, kindly like our Facebook page, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you. been known for being rich and vibrant and a big aspect that contributes to our legacy is the heart in our community there is a lot of history to behold at Bahai Chinoy. So in an effort to learn more about our roots, I went for a tour with the help of Miss Maya Ang Si. So this is the area of the Sanglai. So they refer to the um, Chinese during the Spanish period, those who come here often. The Sanglai, when they came here, uh, because of the same reasons that our OFWs leave the Philippines. These are things that you don't see in history books, but it's part of history books. The colonial economy during mm -hmm. the Spanish period, if it weren't for the Chinese, it wouldn't run. Mm -hmm. So, why is it not in our history books? Maybe because they're foreigners. Yeah. In the Spanish period, there were Sanglai. They come here to work, and then they go back to China. Mm -hmm. um, this extends all the way to the American period. Mm -hmm. The primary difference is that during the American period, there was a law called the Chinese Exclusion Act. So the law says, if you are Chinese and you're coming here, you have to be a merchant or a son of merchant. And then they call themselves the Hua Chao, Hua mm -hmm. Um, because they are migrants. They really are OCW, Overseas oh. Chinese Workers. Oh, yes. There's a lot of misconception that the Chinese are all in business. Mm -hmm. eh, it is not a racial thing. Mm -hmm. It's a law thing. It was a law. We have a lot of famous people here in the Philippines mm -hmm. who actually have Chinese lineage. Mm -hmm. no, um, Jaime Cardinal Sin, mm -hmm. no, um, Cory Aquino, they contribute so much to the Philippines in general, um, but not because of their Chinese lineage. Mm -hmm. It's really because they are Filipinos. Mm -hmm. So at this point, they are now foreign. Mm -hmm. no, you have foreign like you and me, mm -hmm. we're Chinoy. We are no longer Huaqiao mm -hmm. because we're not going back to China. Chinoy is actually is actually a term that um, our organization invented in the oh, 1990s. Yes. We needed a term to reflect our identity as a people that we are Filipino, but we do have a Chinese cultural background mm -hmm. that we celebrate, that we recognize and celebrate. Mm -hmm. And so we came up with Chinoy. Chinoy. That's nice. Wow. It really makes you appreciate everything all the more and understand. Yes. Who knew our history was that extensive and rich? From being immigrants for most of our history to being full-fledged Filipinos in the 70s. Learning about our history truly puts being a Chinoy in a whole new light and is nothing short of amazing.
Okay. Um, good evening, everyone. Thank you for uh, thank you for joining our fellowship activity tonight. And um, I hope that you're all doing well in the aftermath of uh, the typhoon. Um, the topic tonight has to do with uh, two of the major religions practiced by Filip Chinese Filipinos and even Filipinos, um, Buddhism and Christianity. Is there a conflict between the two? Let's hear it from Ms. Father Ari D, a well-regarded academic and the current president of uh, Savior School. Father Ari should know this topic very well because he did his uh, doctoral dissertation on this very topic. Father Ari, welcome and thank you for sharing your time and knowledge with us tonight. Um, so shall we start with the Kaisa Credo? Um, everyone, uh, Kaisa officers and members, please, uh, the Kaisa Credo. Okay. Um, the Philippines is our country. It is the land of our birth, the home of our people. Our blood may be Chinese, but our roots grow deep in Philippine soil. Our bonds are with the Filipino people. We are proud of the many cultures which have made us what we are, and it is our desire, our hope, and aspiration that with the rest of our people, we shall find our rightful place in the Philippine sun. And uh, for our opening remarks, may we invite our president, uh, Michael Guzman, to give, uh, give uh, his opening remarks. Mike, the floor is yes. yours. Yes. Uh, good evening, Kaisa family, friends, partners, board, and trustees. Thank you for joining our Kaisa November webinar with Father Aristotle D. Father Ari D has been a longtime friend and very supportive of Kaisa activities through the years. He is also a contributor for Kaisa publication, Tulai. Now, Father Ari D is helping us for the online edition of Tulai. Today, he will share to us about his research on Christianity and Buddhism, a topic that is very relevant and interesting for the Chinoy family, a topic that is also very close to my heart. Our eldest son Miko is studying in Savior School. And ever since he was born, we have been attending the Chinese New Year Mass in many the Queen Church. This has been come our family tradition. Before we formally start our webinar, let me share to you this painting by Giuseppe Castiglioni. His Chinese name is Lang Shi Ning, an Italian Jesuit priest from Milan. He arrived in Beijing in 1715 and became the official artist at the Imperial Court of Three Emperors, the Kangxi, Yongzheng, and Qianlong Emperors. The harvest green painting or the Palai painting can be found in the Kaisa ballroom in the second floor of Kaisa Heritage Center. The original painting can be found in the Beijing Palace Museum. Father Giuseppe Castiglioni, painting is just one example of how there can be harmony between the East and the West, between Christianity and Buddhism. It also shows the Christianity along with the history of the mission of the Jesuits in China and Buddhism has a long history of relationships. Before we formally introduce our speaker for today's webinar, let's welcome Thomson Lau our Secretary General to give some backgrounds about Kaisa Parasa Kaunaran and its recent activities. Uh, Johnson, uh, Thompson. Thank you, President Mike. For those who haven't know yet about Kaisa, let me take the opportunity to give you a glimpse of what Kaisa is. Kaisa para sa Kaunlaran began on August 28, 1987 as a non-government organization aimed to promote the integration of the Chinese Filipino in the mainstream Philippine society. 
Kaisa helps bring Chinese Filipinos into meaningful participation in nation, national concern. It also hopes to enhance the Filipinos' understanding and awareness of ethnic Chinese minority. Here are some major activities of Kaisa for the past 33 years. For some projects uh, through the years, Kaisa continues to receive support from all sectors of Filipino and Chinese Filipino communities. The fund drive for the Kaisa Heritage Center received positive response from a diverse cross-section of personalities and organizations, including the alumni and family associations in Chinoy community. While Kaisa's work is far from over, members are sec secure in the knowledge that for better or for worse, Kaisa's presence has made a difference. Through its social civic and development project, Kaisa reach, reaches out to the grassroots. Nation building and poverty alleviation are the keywords of the decades. Integration is to be achieved through helping this country. Some projects under, under this are Ally Medicina. Since 1987, Kaisa volunteers have been going to P to give medicines to the most indigent patient in urgent need. Other projects like Alay Dunong, Alay Puso, and Skills and Entrepreneurship Trainings. Kaisa also organized Christmas gift giving to indigent families as well as other meaningful and timely projects like bloodletting and relief work during calamities. Assistance is given to victims of natural calamities like typhoon, flood, earthquake, and mountain Pinatubi eruption, and recently the Mount uh, Taal incident. Through its research and publication, Kaisa acts as a bridge for information dissemination. We have Tulai. It is a fortnightly Chinese Filipino digest in English and Filipino. For readers in Chinese, Kaisa offers the weekly supplement Yong Hap, which means integration, published in the World News, a Chinese language daily. This aims to bridge of understanding between Filipino and Chinese cultures and the link of tolerance between the younger and older generation of the Chinese in the Philippines. Kaisa also participated and organize different national and international conventions. Wherein Kaisa convened the first, second, and third, and fourth uh, national Chinoy convention in the Philippines. The last but not the least is the Bahai Chinoy. Bahai Chinoy, a museum of Chinese in the Philippine life. This museum takes you through the saga of the Chinese Filipinos as their identities in this islands transformed and evolved from merchant sailors to immigrant laborers to mestizos to illustrados to revolutionary le, revolutionists and to Chinois continuing to help this building this nation. For the past few months, Kaisa served as the central hub for our KKK or Kaisa Contra Corona project, wherein we have sent PPEs to different parts of our country, together with Towns Foundation, UP Medical Foundation, Philippine Navy, and other supporters of Kaisa para sa kaunlaran. To know more about the projects of Kaisa and Bahay Chinoy, please like uh, our Facebook page and follow us on Twitter and Instagram. Thank you. Back to you, Reynard. Uh, before we uh, move on to the next segment, um, the, uh, may I remind everyone to uh, take note of uh, their questions because there will be a Q&A portion after Father Ari's uh, lecture and we will be consolidating. You, you can uh, put your questions in the chat box and then we will consolidate everything. So questions of a similar nature will be asked uh, in one instance. Now to introduce our speaker tonight, may we request Kaisa's uh, founding president, Ms. Stacy Angsi, to do the honor. Okay, good evening, everyone. I have known Father Ari B 32 years ago when he just finished college. And I followed his career 
uh, starting with his entry to priesthood, his ordination as a Jesuit priest. I'm most impressed by his dedication and passion in everything he does, research, writing, teaching, and most importantly, his role as priest and counselor, whose door is open to all. Being Chinoy, he of course becomes one of the most, uh, one of the favorites of Chinoy parishioners who know that Father Ari could always relate and understand their burdens better. Father Ari got his master's degree in Buddhism studies from the University of Hong Kong and his doctorate from the University of London, SOAS, School of Oriental and African Studies. He did a lot of primary research and found the faith pavement while doing his PhD dissertation on Chinese Buddhism in the Philippines, which was published by Anvil in 2015. In 2018, he edited a collection of essays comparing Ignatian spirituality and Buddhism and writing Ignatian spirituality and Buddhism. These are essays that uh, he had collected and written about, and this was also published by Anvil. As communications major in his undergrad years in Ateneo, he generously, he, he uses his expertise to generously help Kaisa in our Tulai Chinese Filipino Digest and recently offered to help in our social media presence uh, and possible online edition for Tulai. Of course, his primary duty now is the president of Xavier School, which has campuses in San Juan in the Valley and the Valley Laguna. But not only that, Xavier also assists ERDA and Tiongse Academy, my alma mater. I know our principal in Tiongse is here in the, in the webinar. Uh, Father Ari is also chairman of the network of 10 Jesuit schools in the Philippines, known as the Jesuit Basic Education Commission and vice president of the Philippine Association for Chinese Studies, uh, a think tank on Chinese issues, Philippines-China relations, and Chinese in the Philippines. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm honored to give you Kaisa's friend, Kaisa's partner, and our guest speaker tonight, Father Aristotle D. Father Ari. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Tessie, for that very uh, kind introduction. Um, let me just uh, share my screen. Let's start with the title slide. There we are. So first of all, thank you very much for that introduction, Ms. Tessie. So you counted the years since we first met, no? So it reminded me of a letter to the editor I once wrote, which generated some, <laughs> uh, or a lot of discussion when I was still in school. But thank you again to friends from Kaisa, especially President Michael Guzman, uh, for this kind of invitation for me to speak on this topic. Now that I'm in education, um, I don't get a lot of opportunities actually to uh, continue reading and researching about the area of my graduate studies. So I welcome this opportunity very much. Thank you also to the Intramuros administration for co-hosting the event. And I'd just like to acknowledge uh, some groups represented very well in our list of attendees. We're about 300 uh, attendees right now. Just want to acknowledge my uh, friends and colleagues from Xavier School, from both campuses, you know, from the board, from the faculty, from the alumni, from Immaculate Conception Academy, our neighboring school, from Tiongse Academy, from York Lynn, from Philippine Cultural High School, welcome to you all, from the Philippine Association of Chinese Studies, my colleagues and uh, fellow members from, from there, from uh, the church communities, no? especially from the Jesuit Chinese Philippine Apostolate, I see people from Mary the Queen, from Binondo Chinese Parish, from Sacred Heart Parish in Cebu and Santa Maria in Iloilo, and many, many of the ladies from the Federation of Filipino Chinese Catholic Women's Organizations. And last but not least, given our topic uh, today, a big welcome to our friends from the Buddhist communities. I, I see uh, representatives of uh, Fokongshan, Mabuhay Temple, and Sokyan Temple. So it's uh, easy to all of you. So here we are, let me get started on this topic, Christianity and Buddhism, friends or competitors. So 
is that really a question? You can guess that my answer is that they are friends. We are friends. So this picture of Jesus and the Buddha embracing is of course imagined because they were separated by more than five centuries. The Buddha came much earlier than Jesus Christ. But if they were to meet, I think they would recognize something very deep in each other. So that is what we are going to talk about tonight. Uh, on the surface, when you are too uh, exclusive in your thinking, you might think that religions are competing with one another. And the Catholic Church maybe was guilty of that in the past uh, by teaching that salvation is only through the church. But so much has changed, no? especially since the Second Vatican Council. So much has changed in the attitude of the church towards other religions. It is so, so much uh, more friendly right now. So obviously, I would, I would like to speak of Buddhism and Christianity being friends. Now, some of the teasers uh, in the run-up to our talk tonight, uh, some of the teasers were asking questions like, well, do you have an altar at home where you keep the Catholic saints and the Virgin Mary, the Santo Nino, together with Kuan Yin, the Bodhisattva? Uh, do you go to church and also go to the temple? Uh, that's a phenomenon no, in the Chinese Filipino community. And if you ask people what's going on there, uh, these are some of the easy answers that you will hear. That, oh, it's all the same especially Catholicism and Buddhism. So many of the rituals are similar. They have similar intentions, similar styles, etc. You have people who go to temple, go to church, and they even describe themselves. I, I was very struck one time looking at a survey of students and, and they were asked, what's your religion? And some said, oh, I'm a Buddhist Catholic, no? meaning they, they participate uh, in, in worship or in services of both traditions. No? Or uh, modern people sometimes talk about inter-spirituality, drawing from many sources, many springs, or even multiple religious belonging, no? feeling that, oh, I belong to different religions, especially if you're Chinese, it's not only Buddhism, you have you know, venerating or even worshiping ancestors, you have some Taoism, you have some Feng Shui, putting it all together, uh, it's all good, all the same. They all teach you how to be good, to how to pray for protection, how to help others. So I, I put that all under the label of easy answers. Easy answers. That's the easy way out to just say it's all good, it's all the same. But I think if you're attending this talk tonight, you're interested in more than just the easy answers and you want to learn more. You want to understand more. And therefore, I'd like to offer you in, in, in the time we have tonight, um, some ideas under these headings no? for Christianity and Buddhism. I'd like to talk about Jesus Christ and the historical Buddha, Shakyamuni Buddha, Shuchamoni Fo, and uh, what similarities can we see in these two very important figures, not only in religious history, but in the history of the world, given the number of countries uh, where their religion spread the number of cultures that they penetrated, their contributions, not only to a limited uh, number of people or a fixed community, but really worldwide. And then another example, uh, one of the saints in the Catholic Church, the founder of the Jesuits, Ignatius Loyola, and how he is the same, his journey is similar to the Buddha also. Uh, and I put, put there his, his name as Siddhartha Gautama. And then what kind of dialogue has gone on between Buddhism and Christianity? And finally, yes, we'd like to think of them as friends, but what kind of friends are they? No? So let's think about that tonight. So let me begin then with Christ and the Buddha. So here I'm using their titles, remember? Christ is not the surname of Jesus. This is his title. Christ means the anointed one or the Messiah. And in the same way, the Buddha, that is the title given to Siddhartha Gautama after his enlightenment. He had attained Buddhahood. So he is known to us as the Buddha. And the first similarity we find, it comes from their birth. No? Without going into the details, we know that their 
birth into this world uh, was accompanied by a lot of mystery you know, that they were born to chaste women. Uh, there were special witnesses around, you know, uh, special creatures also like angels or devas who witnessed their birth. Next, we see another similarity in their experience of enlightenment around the age of 30. I don't know how familiar you are with the life story of the Buddha, but he was brought up in, in, in the nobility. He had a very good life, very sheltered life, in fact, inside the palace. And when he, he grew up, he happened to wander outside the palace and for the first time encountered sickness, old age, and death. And that shattered his world you know, to find out that there are such experiences in the world. So he goes into a journey of, of searching for six years, trying out different practices, different traditions, until at the end of those six years, after trying out so many uh, spiritual paths, he attains enlightenment while meditating under the Bodhi tree. For Jesus, also around the age of 30, he had his temptation in the desert. And after that period of, of trial, of intense prayer, he goes to his distant cousin, uh, John the Baptist, uh, to start his public ministry. And you have that supernatural experience of the Holy Spirit descending upon him. So these two events can be put in parallel. No, Around the same age, they, they have this very personal experience of the sacred, of transformation, and after that, they begin a very public ministry. For Jesus, it was very short, just a few years. For the Buddha, you may be surprised to know, after his enlightenment, he didn't just disappear. He went on to preach for 45 years. 45 years. So, so that's the second uh, similarity. Now, the third similarity is in their teaching. The speci specifically, their wisdom teaching which includes ethics. Both of them, if you go to, to, through the literature, spoke of following the way. Well, the early Christians, if you focus or if you concentrate your attention on the New Testament, especially on St. Paul, early Christianity was known as the way, you know, a certain way of living, a certain way of relating with God and with others. And the same way with the Buddha, you know, the, this description of uh, his invitation, his path as the way. And under that, there are at least three important ideas um, to, to remember. So for the Buddha, there was the idea of enlightenment, of awakening, of liberation. And that is the goal. You know, he invites people to learn from him, to follow on his path. And the end goal is to be enlightened, to be awakened. You know, what? How did Jesus put it. Jesus put it as a new way of seeing. So again, if you go back to the Gospels, you, you'll find so many passages about light, about sight, about discipleship, about following Jesus as a new way of seeing the world. And that's not just something poetic, but something he tried to teach his followers in, in very different ways, because it's not as simple as it seems. And then what does transformation mean in the two traditions? Now, in Buddhism, uh, we can say it's about the, the process, the journey from grasping to letting go. And in Christianity, we talk about uh, the journey from death to life. So very ironic, no? unless the grain of wheat falls in, into the earth and dies, it remains just a seed the example of Jesus himself, you know, his passion, death, and resurrection, that he has to die so that he can rise again and attain our salvation, our redemption. So in both cases, there's this idea of letting go or of dying, you know, just a different uh, formulation, but there's a similarity there in movement. And then compassion. For both traditions, this is so strong, the importance of Practice, not just talking about compassion, but practicing compassion, whether in service of others or through uh, our services, how we uh, cultivate the mind and cultivate the spirit. Both traditions have their version of the golden rule. 
Now, since this is a primarily Christian uh, audience, uh, allow me to say a little more about what Buddhism teaches. You know, when the Buddha uh, started teaching, uh, you know, when you think of Buddhism, sometimes you think of a very colorful phenomenon, so many temples, so many rituals, very rich. But if you go to the core teachings, especially of early Buddhism, then you, you get to what the Buddha was really talking about, because, you know, we can get lost uh, in rituals. And, and I, I say that for both Buddhism and the Catholic uh, Church, no? You have to go to the core teachings to know what it's really about. Now for Buddhism, uh, there's, there are these four noble truths, no? First is that all life is suffering. That is the observation of the Buddha. You know, when he left his palace, when he went out into the world and he, he encountered for the first time old age, sickness, death, he saw that human life is, is filled with experiences of suffering. And that's just the givenness of it. That is what it is. It is what it is. So that's his diagnosis of the human condition. There is suffering. Second, that suffering is caused by desire. Okay, that's so sounds so simple, but think about it, no? that we suffer because we are desiring something. And if you don't get that something, whatever it is, wealth, a person, an experience, if you don't get what you desire, you suffer in your heart, in your body. Okay, so the way to eliminate suffering is to eliminate desire. No? So now you can think about uh, what I said earlier, no grasping, instead letting go. If you don't grasp, if you let go, then you will be freed and, and you will not suffer anymore. Now, how to do that? How to attain that? Well, follow the eightfold path so that desire will be extinguished. So you follow, you know, you can look at this, this as a medical experience. No? There's a diagnosis, there's a cause, there's a cure, and then you have your medication, the Eightfold Path. What's the Eightfold Path? Very simple. And you have the elements here of wisdom. You need right understanding, intention, and speech. You need morality. Your words have to be right, your action, your livelihood, your effort. And then this is what uh, many people don't realize about Buddhism. Uh, in the end, you need right mindfulness, right concentration. So it's not only about ideas, it's not only about ethics. You need mindfulness, you need concentration, you need to focus your mind if you want to attain uh, nirvana or liberation. So that's a brief segue into a core teaching of Buddhism as we proceed. No? looking at the two traditions. There's this little, almost like a coffee table book, Jesus and the Buddha, the parallel sayings, where you have their, many of their teachings put side by side. No? If you can find it, it's just a very enriching book that will give you in greater detail, no? scriptures from the Bible, and then parallel sayings from uh, the Buddhist sutras. So again, Christ and the Buddha. You know? Jesus Christ talked a lot about establishing the reign or the kingdom of God. That is what he came to inaugurate. You know? That was his formulation of what the end goal is. To establish a kingdom, which is not a material kingdom, but a spiritual community that can begin right here on earth, but will reach its fullness uh, in heaven or at, at the end times. But the Buddha expressed uh, his end goal as enlightenment, you know, liberation of the mind from all this grasping, from all this desire. And to get to that goal, Christianity would have a practice of prayer. And here is one major difference because when Christians pray, we pray to a personal God. God is Abba, God is Father. And we know his son, Jesus Christ. We know the Holy Spirit. So there's a very personal dimension to Christianity that is not always present in Buddhism. In Buddhism, you have meditation. It's not necessarily directed at the Buddha or some being, but cultivation of your own mind, your own practice. So I put there uh, the difference between having a personal God and experiencing a Godhead, 
no for for uh, there there can be many other equivalent terms no god as a primordial principle as ultimate being as an uncreated source if you describe god if we describe god in that way then it is much closer i think to to the buddhist goal of uh, enlightenment of being one with that of non duality in christianity there's ideas of uh, redemptive suffering no, the suffering has a value it can be embraced it can be accepted for a higher value as jesus did with his death and resurrection vis-a-vis uh, -vis in buddhism uh, the goal is to eliminate suffering no so uh, these these are some key differences in the formulations no at least in the popular understanding of uh, the religious journey uh, christians talk about eternal life in god Buddhists talk about karma and rebirth. No, for Christians, there's only one life. You better make good of it. In the Buddhist system, there is karma cycles of rebirth. Uh, and if you're born uh, as a human being, you're, you're fortunate because you can only be enlightened or liberated as a human being. So you better make good of that opportunity. No? So cycles of rebirth. These are therefore some ideas, some comparisons of uh, Christ and the Buddha. The, the final similarity is what happened after their time on this earth. No? In both traditions, for the next three, four centuries after their death, you see their identity as human or as divine. Uh, a certain theology develops about them after their time. So this is not something they did for themselves. It's after their time, their disciples began to theologize, to reflect about who they were, and then to write that down. No? So for Christians, you have the Nicene Creed, which we recite every Sunday at church. It summarizes all those centuries of, of debate, of discussion about who Jesus Christ is. And for, Buddhist, for the Buddha, you have the Buddhist Sutras, which is also a very complex topic. But that is the literature that, that they have uh, that encapsulates, that summarizes the key teachings of uh, the Buddha. Okay, and then um, after the development of the scriptures of both traditions, then you have the place of Jesus in the Judeo-Christian narrative. No, he belongs to that tradition of Israel, no? the full, full fulfillment of the Jewish scriptures and then starting the movement of Christianity. Uh, and you compare that to what the Buddha's invitation was to all his followers. You see, it was not the intention of the Buddha to start a religion. Well, neither was it the intention of Jesus. No, Both were inviting people to a certain path, to a certain journey. And especially for the Buddha, that he highlights that, highlights that so much, no? that everyone can become a Buddha. So he starts with his closest disciples and then goes on, enlarges the community. So you can have Buddhas with a small b because uh, that is the invitation to everybody. No, there's not only one Buddha, there are many Buddhas. In fact, part of uh, the theologizing, the reflection after the Buddha's time on earth is the insight that there have been many Buddhas before him and that there is also a cosmic Buddha. No, so this is now uh, complex uh, Buddhist theology, but just to let you know that uh, when you say the Buddha, when you say Buddhas, there are many. We're not talking only of the Buddha that we know, the historical Buddha. In both traditions also, there's a very strong anticipation for a future time of fulfillment. Christians talk about the end times, the second coming of Christ, certain time of fulfillment when everything will be brought to completion uh, by Jesus Christ. We talk about communion of saints, being reunited with our deceased loved ones, something we highlight a lot this month. No? For Buddhism, there is also uh, that idea that is a future Buddha coming, and his name is Maitreya. Uh, and that is also a time of uh, fulfillment for the world or the universe. So given all of this background, can we think of Jesus as a Buddha? Not some bold... Uh, thinkers or artists have, have tried to introduce that idea that Jesus was also an awakened one. No? Um, I just leave that with you for your, to tickle your mind, to tickle your 
uh, reflection. So I need to move on to the next uh, section uh, quickly. Uh, if we compare Jesus and the Buddha, Jesus Christ and the Buddha, we can also look at uh, one of the disciples of Jesus, uh, many centuries later, Ignatius of Loyola, whose spirituality finds uh, many meeting points with Buddhism. So this is the book Tessie uh, talked about in the beginning, uh, uh, a collection that I edited a few years ago. So some similarities also between Ignatius and Siddhartha, you know, just to use the names uh, they grew up with. Both had noble birth, born to families of means. Both had their conversion experience. For the Buddha, I mentioned earlier al already, his experience of old age sickness, death, and then uh, going on a spiritual journey for Ignatius, the famous Battle of Pamplona, where he shattered his right leg and was, he was forced to recuperate at the family home, had nothing to read, and that is when he had the spiritual conversion. No, by reading the life of Christ and the lives of the saints. Both of them both had an ascetic face. No? Ignatius, after recovering, wanted to devote himself no longer to, to winning wars, but to become a soldier of Christ. And he wasn't sure how to do that. So he went on this ascetic phase, trying to live as a poor man, going to the Holy Land, trying to discern, trying to figure out what is God's will for him. And the Buddha, the same. No? Uh, he tried uh, various practices, no? some as uh, difficult, as austere, as fasting. That's why you have this picture of him, the skin and bones. No? So that phase of uh, disciplining the body by denying it food, denying it pleasures. No? And then that moment of enlightenment for the Buddha under the Bodhi tree for Ignatius by the river Cardonaire, no? where he uh, spent almost a year uh, praying, meditating, and, and that is where he formulated his spiritual exercises. And after that, uh, founding a new community around themselves you know, and practicing. Uh, this is very important, no? not just talking about uh, their spiritual path, but practicing it together in a community. So those are the similarities between Ignatius and Siddhartha. And just to say something about the spirituality of, of St. Ignatius, no? based on his experience in Manresa, where he had his uh, enlightenment or spiritual awakening, he wrote this retreat manual with the insight that spiritual exercise is just as important as physical exercise. He had a program of prayer divided into weeks, and the movement is from purification of yourself to illumination to union with Christ. So ideally, it's done as an individually directed retreat with a focus on discernment, knowing what God's will is for you and knowing when it's not God moving you, but the evil one, you know, and then election or making a good decision, a good choice. So if we compare Ignatius and Buddhist, uh, the spiritual exercises of St. Ignatius and Buddhist spirituality, you, you find uh, these similarities, the idea of a middle way, you know? uh, the practice of con deep consciousness, deep awareness, mindfulness. You know, that's why I always tell Christians who are uh, pursuing an interest in Buddhism that it's not because um, such practices are not present in Christianity. It's just that it's not very well known. This is not mainstream. The idea of detachment, Oh, in, in Buddhism, it's, it's formulated as no self or ego. For Ignatius, the practice of indifference, don't prefer this or that. You must choose only what is good for you, what God's will is. And in that sense, be indifferent. The Buddhist uh, goal of nirvana compared to uh, Ignatius's illumination or union with the divine. And then, of course, the most... Uh, famous of the meeting points, meditation methods, especially Zen. But there are also differences. No? Uh, we have to say that in Buddhism, um, the question of God it does not figure very much. Uh, it's not so much that the Buddha denied the existence of God, but this is just not the question he faced. 
no he was concerned about the problem of suffering and and desire and eliminating that no so there is no relationship with a personal deity the way christians have got the father or the way we focus on be, being disciples of jesus christ of you know uh, centering our lives on christ christocentrism no um attitude to the senses no um we are told in the bible to love god with our entire being you no know, my entire my mind my body my strength everything versus the goal in meditation of nothingness for achieving nothingness of no no more dualities no more no more no more uh subject object dichotomy you know? and then the difference between focusing on knowledge and focusing on love you know? so these are some differences in the two traditions where do they meet synthesis points well both traditions are very strong on this dynamism this relationship between what is transcendent what is out there what is beyond and what is also at the same time even if it's out there it is also within you no? that you want to be united with god but god is also within you no? um we want to stop grasping you want to let go but to do that you have to work on yourself no so this interplay of transcendence what is beyond what is without and what is within the idea of re all reality being one no the vietnamese monk tik nhat han that is what tnh means calls it interbeing how everything in the universe is connected no or for saint ignatius he calls that finding god in all things no so the ways of being in the world are are it, it, that's a synthesis point no ignatius talks about you have to be a contemplative no somebody who sees and understands deeply in the world no not being separate by hiding in the monastery you're in the world but you're a contemplative no so god in all things or the buddhists would at least especially in mahayana buddhism would talk about the buddha nature being in all no? and being present there so these are some synthesis points now i move to the third part very quickly um buddhism and christianity separated by five centuries but the two have come into dialogue you no know? especially when christian started taking serious interest in buddhism not seeing it as you know simply a pagan religion but recognizing that there is something very deeply spiritual about the buddhist path you no know? and that goes all the way back to francis xavier encountering buddhism in japan in the 16th century another i have slides for this actually i can show you their pictures uh, another jesuit missionary desideri who was in tibet uh, in the 17th century so these are all stories in themselves but i just mentioned them to you to give you an idea of what what has happened in this area in japan so much has happened the german jesuit uh, hugo enomia lasal you no know, studied zen under a zen master got into a little trouble for doing that but became a zen master himself and trained others in japan and in europe and then you have also the japanese uh, jesuit kakichi kadowaki who also became a zen practitioner uh, trained under a zen master and found the meeting points between zen and the bible you know, and some of his uh, chapters i i put in in that book that i edited in sri lanka very famous uh, aloysius piris no dialogue in this time with theravada buddhism sometimes also described as early buddhism you know this is the earliest practice uh, of buddhism i will we'll return to him later but in india a uh, very popular figure when i was in school no anthony de mello uh introducing practices of vipassana of deep meditation uh, as a way to god as a pre preparatory practice to focus the mind prepare it for encountering the word of god in the bible so all of this just to show you that as uh, in the last 200 years and have to say also that this kind of dialogue uh really took off only in the last 200 years no so for the first uh 18 centuries of uh, christianity there wasn't much uh, happening really uh, even if buddhism 
had already been around for five centuries. So now you have uh, Catholics talking about mindfulness. This is not such a big word now in education in the West, people who don't like institutional religion, but, but you know, you invite them to a mindfulness uh, seminar or practice, uh, it will be very popular. And then you have people reflecting on, on the relationship between the G Jesus and the Buddha, you know, uh, depicted in modern art here, uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, the Vietnamese monk who found a base in France and many other authors working in this area. Now, finally, uh, so that we can open it up for questions. No? So we'd like to say that Buddhism and Christianity are religion, are, are friends and they are in dialogue with each other. No? But I think we have to be clear in our thinking uh, how we describe this relationship. For a very long time, the thinking in the church, in the Christian churches was exclusivist. And we have to admit there are still people who think this way today very exclusive, meaning outside the church, there is no salvation. No? Um, th that explains the crusades, that explains a lot of violence between and among religions. No? And then you have pluralists. This is what I described at the beginning. Pluralism accepts everything and everyone, para no problem. All religions are equal or the same, should never fight should never quarrel about religion. You just respect it, respect each one's religion. That's a pluralist position. And then you have the inclusivist position, meaning whatever my system is, whatever my worldview is, I can incorporate others into that worldview. So for Christians, uh, there are strands of theology that talk about the universal or cosmic Christ not Jesus Christ, the historical person, uh, but the cosmic Christ. And if you think of the cosmic Christ, that is a very broad idea or concept that can em embrace even non-Christians. Or one theologian, Rahner, talked about anonymous Christians, people who live good lives, who follow their conscience. They may not be Christians formally, but they're anonymous Christians. But you see, this kind of thinking can can, can be used by any religion. There is also the idea of a universal or cosmic Buddha. And it is that Buddha nature that pervades all. No? If there's an anonymous Christian, <coughs> excuse me, there can also be an anonymous Buddhist. See, so it's an asymmetrical uh, paradigm. Uh, other ways of describing this is your crossing traditions or passing over. Now, um, uh, another way of looking at this is to synthesize syncretism in a positive sense. Or Aloysius Pierce talks about symbiosis, or some describe it as enculturation. So this is again Father Pierce, and he has done a lot of work in reconciling early Buddhism with Christianity. And just to share with you his definition of uh, symbiosis, you know, symbiosis does not seek to unify or combine diverse elements in a transcendent whole. No? So that's very important. You're not trying to easily just put things together, combine them, uh, and 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 pretend that it it makes up a whole because it doesn't. You cannot just do that. Symbiosis allows the maintenance of each tradition's integrity in mutually supportive relations with the other. So you let each tradition, each religion stand on its own feet and you respect that. You don't try to, to say that the meeting points are, are complete or are, are, are absolute. No? Gnosis or liberative knowledge of Buddhism and agape or redemptive love of, of Christianity are always overlapping. They overlap, but you can't say they're the same because there's a certain texture to each that needs to be respected. But in all things, the practice is more important than the theory. Now, orthopraxy, you know, doing things together, practicing together vis-a-vis -vis orthodoxy. Because if we are concerned about orthodoxy, then it's about doctrine, about everybody agreeing, 
uh, on doctrines and ideas. And you know, if you've ever been to a meeting, you know that's the most difficult thing to get everybody to think in the same way. No, but if you're we're able to set that aside, then we can be friends and practice together, meditate together, do good deeds together, serve others together. So to answer that question, what kind of friend do we want to be? Of course, we're friends, but let us not be the superficial kind of friend that mixes and matches without discipline and reflection. So in my many years of giving talks in the Chinese Catholic communities, this has been my response no, to, to that phenomenon that we all observe. Oh, going to church, going to temple, uh, altars with so many statues. Uh, that's a, that can be a starting point. No, but if you stay there, it's, I think it's, it stays on the superficial level. If you really want to pursue the friendship, then you have to go deep, deeper you know, into practice, into reflection. And I love what uh, Buddhist leaders have said about the relationship between Buddhism and Christianity. When they said that a, a Christian learns from the best of Buddhism and becomes a better Christian, especially through meditation, through detachment, through compassionate practice. And I want towards the end to share just these quotes with you. The Dalai Lama who wrote about this in The Good Heart, a Buddhist perspective on the teachings of Jesus. Don't try to use what you learn from Buddhism to, to be a better Buddhist. Use it to be a better whatever you already are. So if you're a Christian and you're learning from Buddhism, use it to become a better Christian or whatever other tradition you belong to. So I'm very touched and very uh, amazed that uh, you have very contemporary Buddhist leaders saying that they're not out to convert the Christians. No, they learn the richness, they share the richness of Buddhism so that Christians can become better Christians. The other one is the one I mentioned earlier, Thich Nhat Hanh, who has so many books on, on mindfulness and Zen. And this is one of the quotes from him. There is a misconception that Buddhism is a religion and that you worship Buddha. Buddhism is a practice like yoga. You can be a Christian and practice Buddhism. I met a Catholic priest who lives in a Buddhist monastery in France. He told me that Buddhism makes him a better Christian. And I love that. So he, he you know, encapsulates a lot of ideas there. You know, the Buddhism, uh, it's not a religion, although it really looks like a religion, because historically, especially in Mahayana, the, the followers of the Buddha turned him into a god and, and came up with so many practices that for all intents and purposes make Buddhism look like a religion. But at the core of the Buddha's teaching, it is not a religion. That he, the Buddha is not there to be worshipped. No, he is there as a great teacher. So I end with this. Uh, parallel uh, teaching from that book I mentioned earlier. On compassion, from the Gospel of John, this is my commandment, love one another as I have loved you. No one has greater love than this to lay down one's life for one's friends. So any Christian will be familiar with that. Uh, and then you have uh, from the Buddha, just as a mother would protect her only child at the risk of her own life, even so, cultivate a boundless heart towards all beings. Let your thoughts of boundless love pervade the whole world. From the Sutra Nipata. So I end there, and thank you very much for your attention. Um, thank you very much, Father Ari, for your sharing. And that was really very informative. Uh, before we proceed to the uh, open forum, I'd like again to thank, on behalf of Kaisa, uh, I'd like to thank IA for lending us their Zoom account. We have a very good number tonight, 356, which is beyond expectations. And then also I'd like to acknowledge those who participated, especially those who are from halfway around the world. It's, a, it's an inconvenient time, um, perhaps. So they come as far afield as the U.S. And then some are from our friends from Iloilo. From Mindanao, there's uh, from Iloilo, there's uh, Bombing Ku, and then I'd like to acknowledge also from the Philippine Association of China Chinese Studies, the si President uh, Romel Banlawi, and also uh, Mr. Wilfrido Villacorta, and also a big big thanks 
to the Xavier Alumni Association, not only for participating in tonight's uh, webinar, but also helping disseminate info about uh, tonight's activity. Um, some other people we'd like to acknowledge, Mr. Peter Gaisano, and then principals and teachers from York Lynn, Pyongse High School, Philippine Cultural College. Uh, welcome and thank you. Now we are going to proceed to the open forum. So my co-moderator here would be Maya Angsi. Uh, so I guess let's uh, start with some of the questions. Um, that's okay. These are some of these are consolidated. Uh, so Father Ari, this is uh, okay. Somebody asked about the book, Father Ari, where can I get the book uh, titled The Sage and uh, Something? The, the, the book with The Sage and Something. Yeah, the it's Sage the, and the Pilgrim. The Pilgrim. And The Sage. Um, both my books are published by Anvil, Sister Company of National Bookstore. So it should be available there, but depends on the branch also. I, I put my email in the chat box, so if you can't find it, I can help you locate it now. Okay, so Anvil should be available in uh, major bookstores. Um, there's a question here. Is rebirth and reincarnation similar? Well, rebirth is the preferred term of Buddhists, no? Um, because there is a continuity that is lost or, or misinterpreted when you use the word reincarnation, no? So, yeah, um, so it's a matter of the preferred term in Buddhism, which is rebirth. But... but uh, in popular discourse, reincarnation is also used. Okay, this one is... Thank you, yeah. Father. Um, Renard, let me ask this one. Um, vested interest, I'm actually very interested. Um, is it possible, this is from Wesley Chua, is it possible that Buddhism and Christianity came from the same origin? I know they're 5,000 years apart, but um, he read this many years ago that early Christians came from disciples of the Buddha. Yeah, there are many <laughs> conspiracy theories about that, but there has been no conclusive, uh. <laughs> no conclusive evidence that there has actually been contact between Buddhism and, and Jesus Christ himself. Of course, you know, there was a time, Uso Uso Yung, the lost years of Jesus, that Jesus went to India before he appeared on the scene as an adult. There are stories that Buddhist followers traveled across Central Asia and the Mediterranean, and somehow there was contact with the Jews, but none of that has been historically uh, proven. But I think the important thing uh, is not so much to try to, to establish that, but to say that uh, had a depth of spiritual experience, a certain conversion, a certain transformation that really changed the way they saw the world and really attracted uh, massive uh, uh, followers. You know, I, think, I think that's more important than, than you know, trying to put one over the other. Okay. okay. Um, so I also received a private um, private message and then it's connected to one of the questions here about um, so you were talking about Christianity and Buddhism but your context is mostly from the Catholic faith um, so our question now revolves around um, how about Protestant Christians um, they are more resistant to accepting that Buddhism um accepting Buddhism all the way to um, and this goes all the way to um, splitting families where for example one part of the family will want to exercise um, traditional ancestor rights for let's say a dead relative or a dead parent but they're the Protestant uh, part of the family the Protestant relative would refuse to do so and so it causes these uh, conflict within the family. Could you enlighten us on that, Father? Well, you, you describe a reality that can be very painful, no? In, in the best of... It is, uh, it is. In the best of situations, you can have mutual respect. Respect na lang, di ba? Re acknowledge our differences and just respect our, our religious uh, beliefs. But 
um, there are decisions in families uh, where you can split the family, you know, how to honor the dead. Uh, if your parents pass on, who's, and, and the children all belong to different Christian churches or some are Buddhists, sino masusunod? Um, usually the eldest <laughs> or the one paying. <laughs> I mean, to be very frank. <laughs> Ouch. Ouch. Yeah, um, yeah, or, um, if, or if there is enough uh, goodwill, uh, sometimes the compromise is that um, the rituals or the services of all the uh, traditions or religions of the relatives can be given time. So Reynard, sorry, you want to say Let's, let's yeah, throw in another, yeah, I, sorry Reynard, let's throw in another... Sorry. Connected pa rin to this one. Let's throw in another um, religion into the mix. Um, Romel is commenting if yeah. he would have an explanation for um, his impression that Muslims are, are more tolerant of Buddhists than Christians. Um, can I add, sorry, Father, because there's a similar question. Um, sa kanya naman is, uh, from my observation, um, Chris, uh, I mean, Catholics seem to be, to be more tolerant uh, and more accepting of Buddhist beliefs uh, than Protestants. Why is this so? Because this is the same nature question as, as uh, what Romel asked. Romel is from his research. Um, Muslims naman seem to be more accepting of Buddhism. Right. So let me say first, uh, maybe I didn't say enough about this earlier, no? But within the Christian churches, it's true that there is a lot more openness in the Catholic Church, even coming from the official teaching, uh, to engage other religions, to enter into dialogue. And you find that in all the church documents. Even if it's not practiced by all, it's official. There's really dialogue. Whereas in the other Christian churches, um, it's a different theology. Maybe um, it can be described as the exclusivist thinking that I described in one of the slides. No that salvation is only within the church, that you have to have uh, faith in Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. And if, if you focus on that, if that is your starting point, then all religions, not just Buddhism, uh, Taoism, Feng Shui, anything with statues uh, are seen as idolatry. So it's just a fundamental theological uh, difference. No? Uh, and yet both are Christian, right? You have th those strands of Christianity and you have Catholic Christianity, very different approach to other religions. Now, if you expand to other religions, uh, Romel said Muslims more tolerant of Buddhists than Christians. I think that's because of the history between Muslims and Christians. There have been so many wars no, uh, uh, over that, over the differences. We're both monotheistic, but religion has been used as a motivation for violence and, and the Crusades and the Moorish wars in Spain, and Damian, no? Muslims and Christians have been at war for centuries. Whereas Muslims and Buddhists, um, there have been more positive stories of being able to live together, to coexist uh, without violence. No? Not, not all the time. Uh, you think of what's happening in, in uh, Myanmar, for example, there is a violence, but, but on the whole, uh, Buddhism has been perceived as a very peaceful uh, religion. No history of uh, conquests or, or using religion as a pretext for war. Uh, Maya, do you have uh, questions from your end? Um, just reading the, I'm reading the question and answer box. Um, Rocky Laurel is asking, can you please comment on Centering Prayer and Pope Benedict's 1989 letter on some aspects of Christian meditation in quote marks? Um, I think uh, maybe if you could also expound on the, I heard you talk about this before extensively on how um, the, the Buddhists use the body as a centering of prayer, the way they bow and all that, and how that's similar to praying the rosary. I've heard you speak on that before, Father. Maybe you can expound on that also. Thank you. Yeah. Um, 
I, I shared about the meeting points between Ignatian spirituality and certain practices of Buddhism, like Zen, but there are many others, no? like the centering prayer that some have mentioned. Um, some are asking, is that closer to Buddhist practice than Ignatian contemplation? You could say that because there is less content in centering prayer, whereas in Ignatian spirituality, it's more contemplation is about the gospel scenes, but the meeting point is not so much contemplation, but awareness, very deep awareness, which is a starting point of prayer, no? or your daily examine of consciousness. That's a very Buddhist practice of mindfulness uh, also. And then you have, uh, as Maya mentioned, no? praying with your body. Meditation uh, involves a lot of technique. You cannot just lie there or sit there randomly and say that you're meditating. Buddhists have a method, the way you sit, your posture, your back, and all of this. And uh, in Christian traditions, you have that also. You know? uh, praying the rosary while focusing your mind you know, can be very, very effective, except that you know, we, we can become very me mechanical while doing it. But various practices with the point of, or the objective of uh, focusing your mind, concentrating, you know? the mind is always wandering off. So concentrate it, whatever method you use. You know? and, and just to relate that to, to one question I saw in the chat box, so whether these ideas of dialogue, of friendship, whether these are accepted at the highest levels of both Buddhism and Christianity. Well, I can only say that in, in, in the Catholic Church, it's in all the official documents that this dialogue uh, is important and has to take place and has to go deeper. But even if it's in the documents, people without exposure to other religions you know, don't get involved in, in it at all, or at worst, even are negative towards other religions or towards Buddhism. But that comes from a lot, a lot of understanding, I think. No, and if you meet people like that, it's really important to have that dialogue, not to fight, not to quarrel, but to share. No, and and hopefully come to a a, a symbiosis, as uh, I described. Thank you, Father. I think that answers a number of questions already in the chat box. Um, so let's move to um, this one very specific. No, um, we're talking of dialogue. We're talking of um, understanding. Um, and you mentioned about you know in funeral rites you practice whatever the religions of what the, each family member is. But um, how about um, Lillian Yao is asking. Your thoughts about lighting incense for Kuan Yin at family altars and having the Virgin Mary right there beside it. Yeah, I've been asked that many times, and I've hesitated to give a black and white answer that that applies for everybody, no? Because I have to understand what's going on there, no? Why do you have both statues in one altar? The one who is lighting incense, the one praying. Uh, what's going on in your mind? Who are you praying to? You know, and there can be such diversity in the answer to, to that question. For example, I meet a lot of people who say, well, you know, the statue of Kuan Yin or of the Buddha or any other Chinese god, uh, that's for my elders or my in-laws. And I, I'm doing that, observing that out of respect. So, okay, I understand that. I respect that as well. But then later on, the elders are no longer around or have passed on, and yet that altar is still uh, maintained or preserved. If that's the situation, I always go back to the person. Who are you praying to? And what do you really believe? You know, I, I can respect uh, a lot of uh, variations or combinations of, of faith and belief, but I think for each person, that journey is, is so personal and yet so important. You know? And... Uh, if you ask me what I prefer, um, I go with what the Buddhist masters, that, like the Dalai Lama and Thich Nhat Hanh said, you know, that you are born into a, if you are born into a faith tradition, whether that's Christianity or Buddhism, then learning from Buddhism or other religions should make you a better believer, a better practitioner of your own tradition, right? So it's clearer that way for me. And if you want to to teach uh, younger generations, it's also simpler and, and easier. Now, if you have other reasons for, for maintaining multiple, multiple, multiple statues, 
uh, then, then we can respect that too. But I think the important thing is what's really going on in your mind and in your heart. Okay, this, this, there's another question. It goes to the very nature of Buddhism. Since Buddhism does not have a Godhead, is, does Buddhism actually qualify as a religion? And does it even attempt to explain the origin of the universe? Like, is there a force that oversees karma and rebirth? Right, there, there are several questions there. No, I'll start with the last part. Um, is Buddhism concerned about a uh, creator of the universe, where things come from? Uh, no. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the Buddha was, was concerned about the problem of suffering. He wanted to help human beings be liberated from the experience of suffering. So he was very single-minded in addressing this concern. It's not, he's not saying that the universe is not important and those questions are not important. In Buddhist literature, they call that those the unanswered questions because the Buddha did not engage them. All right. Um, is Buddhism a religion? I think originally it was not the intention of the Buddha to found a religion. And if you stick to the early teachings, I think that you can really make a case that Buddhism is a philosophy, a way of life, no? not necessarily a religion. No? Although historically it did become a religion because of what the followers did. You know that Buddhism is not mono monolithic. We've all heard of Tibetan Buddhism, Chinese Buddhism, Korean, Japanese, Southeast Asian, Theravada. They all have their uniqueness. Some of them very, very different from each other. They have their, you know, they have their differences that can be quite pronounced also. No? So many, many variations of uh, Buddhism as it became a religion. And then there's another, yeah, thank you, Father. Yeah, yeah. This one has to do with, are you aware of, uh, with, 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 with a more progressive Pope in the Vatican now, you see statements and from the Catholic Church or statements from the Pope about gender, about the environment, and he seems to be a lot more progressive than previous Popes. Are you aware of um, Buddhist leaders taking similar stances? Well, you, you know, one of the, the criticisms of, of Buddhism is that um, it does not have uh, as developed moral teaching as the Christian churches uh, do. No? So there are many contemporary ethical issues on which Buddhism is silent. No? Or that Buddhism doesn't take a strong position about such uh, matters. And if you recall also what I mentioned, the great diversity within Buddhism, then that complicates it even further. Because whatever, let's say, the Dalai Lama says about some particular topic, you know, some other Buddhist master might have a different opinion. There is no central teaching authority in Buddhism the way we do like in the Catholic Church and in, in Christian theology. You know, there, there may be a lot of differences, but there's also a core that is shared, right, when it comes to social justice and contemporary issues. So I think that explains it. It's just, uh, it's just that in Christianity, social action, social awareness, being concerned about justice uh, is, is uh, highlighted very much. It's a major component. Whereas in Buddhism, I think it's, it's very recent, recent in historical uh, terms that uh, Buddhism has come out much more strongly with a social face. So in our country, for example, the work of Po Kuang Shan or Tzu these have revolutionized the image of Buddhism, no? For them to be concerned about uh, improving the world, about helping the poor, etc. Okay. I guess that's all Thank the time we much, have. Father. Thank you, Father Ari. Yeah. I think that's all the time we have for the Q&A okay. portion. Everybody everyone um for those whose questions were not answered and you really 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 want to want it to be answered please email us at info at bahaychinoy.org or you can message us through facebook and we will pass that along to father Ariti. 
Um, so that's again, that's info at bahaypinoy.org or um, our social media platforms are there. Please message us on Facebook. We will pass that on to Father. For everyone who is asking about the recording, yes, this is currently being streamed live on Facebook and it's also being recorded. Um, once the YouTube recording is up, we will post that as well on the Bahay Chinoy Facebook page as well as the Intramuras Administration Facebook page. Um, lastly, there are a number of people asking about certificates of attendance. Um, if the Please email us at info at bahaychinoy.org. We will be generating an attendance report on our end. And for those who request, we will cross-check that and send you a certificate. Thank you so much, Reynard. Back to you. Yeah, thank you, Maya. I think Father Ari also typed in his uh, email address earlier for those uh, who really want to have their questions answered. Now, uh, may we have Baldwin Po, our Bahay Chinoy Museum, Museum Director for the closing remarks. Baldwin, the floor is yours. Uh, good evening again, everyone. Uh, maraming salamat sa inyong pagdalo. Today, today's talk brought deeper understanding on the role of religion in cultural identity, the blending of cultures, the friendship of the Chinese and Filipino that started centuries before the Spanish colonization. At present, even in community service projects, it is common to see Buddhists and Christian working together. Bahay Chinoy Museum, since it opened in 1999, never stopped telling stories of the Chinese Filipino, the Chinoy. In fact, in this global health crisis, our museum lobby became a packing house of PPE donation drive powered by our network of NGOs. Muli, on behalf of, uh, of the team, Kaisa Heritage Foundation, Kaisa Para Sa Kaunlaran, Intramuros Administration, maraming salamat to our speaker, Father Ari D, and guest participant, pagpalain nawa tayo ng Diyos. Thank you, Baldwin. 